Chapter Six of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, The Crimp Wagon, Military Episodes. The covered wagon to which I was ordered to march was standing, as I have said, in the courtyard of the farm, with another dismal vehicle of the same kind hard by it. Each was pretty well filled with a crew of men, whom the atrocious crimp who had seized upon me had enlisted under the banners of the glorious Frederick. And I could see by the lanterns of the sentinels, as they thrust me into the straw, a dozen dark figures huddled together in the horrible moving prison where I was now to be confined. A scream and a curse from my opposite neighbor showed me that he was most likely wounded, as I myself was and, during the whole of the wretched night, the moans and sobs of the poor fellows in similar captivity kept up a continual painful chorus, which effectually prevented my getting any relief from my ills in sleep. At midnight, as far as I could judge, the horses were put to the wagons, and the creaking, lumbering machines were put in motion. A couple of soldiers, strongly armed, sat on the outer bench of the cart, and their grim faces peered in with their lanterns every now and then through the canvas curtains that they might count the number of their prisoners. The brutes were half drunk and were singing love and war songs, such as O Gretchen, mein Teubchen, mein Herzen's trumpet, mein Cannon, mein Herr Pauke, und meine Musket, Prinz Eugen, der edle Ritter, and the like their wild whoops and yodels making doleful discord with the groans of us captives within the wagons. Many a time afterwards have I heard these ditties sung on the march or in the barrack room or round the fires as we lay out at night. I was not near so unhappy, in spite of all, as I had been on my first enlisting in Ireland. At least, thought I, if I am degraded to be a private soldier, there will be no one of my acquaintance who will witness my shame. And that is the point which I have always cared for most. There will be no one to say, There's young Redmond Barry, the descendant of the Barrys, the fashionable young blood of Dublin, pipe-claying his belt and carrying his brown bess. Indeed, but for that opinion of the world, with which it is necessary that every man of spirit should keep upon equal terms, I, for my part, would have always been contented with the humblest portion. Now here, to all intents and purposes, one was as far removed from the world as in the wilds of Siberia, or in Robinson Crusoe's island. And I reasoned with myself thus. Now you are caught, there's no use in repining. Make the best of your situation, and get all the pleasure you can out of it. There are a thousand opportunities of plunder, etc., offered to the soldier in wartime, out of which he can get both pleasure and profit. Make use of these and be happy. Besides, you're extraordinarily brave, handsome, and clever. Who knows but you may procure advancement in your new service. In this philosophical way I looked at my misfortunes, determining not to be cast down by them, and bore woes and my broken head with perfect magnanimity. The latter was, for the moment, an evil against which it required no small powers of endurance to contend, for the jolts of the wagon were dreadful, and every shake caused a throb in my brain which I thought would have split my skull. As the morning dawned, I saw that the man next me, a gaunt, yellow-haired creature, in black, had a cushion of straw under his head. Are you wounded, comrade? said I. Praised be the Lord, said he. I am sore hurt in spirit and body, and bruised in many members. Wounded, however, am I not. And you, poor youth? I am wounded in the head, said I, and I want your pillow. Give it me. I have a clasp knife in my pocket and with this I gave him a terrible look, meaning to say, and meant it I did, for look you, à la guerre c'est à la guerre, and I am none of your milksops, that, 
unless he yielded me the accommodation, I would give him a taste of my steel. I would give it thee without any threat, friend, said the yellow-haired man meekly, and handed me over his little sack of straw. He then leaned himself back as comfortably as he could against the cart, and began repeating, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott, by which I concluded that I had got into the company of a parson. With the jolts of the wagon, and accidents of the journey, various more exclamations and movements of the passengers showed what a motley company we were. Every now and then a countryman would burst into tears. A French voice would be heard to say, Oh, mon Dieu, mon Dieu. A couple more of the same nation were jabbering oaths and chattering incessantly, and a certain allusion to his own and everybody else's eyes, which came from a stalwart figure at the far corner, told me that there was certainly an Englishman in our crew. But I was spared soon the tedium and discomforts of the journey. In spite of the clergyman's cushion, my head, which was throbbing with pain, was brought abruptly in contact with the side of the wagon. It began to bleed afresh. I became almost light-headed. I only recollect having a draught of water here and there, once stopping at a fortified town where an officer counted us. All the rest of the journey was passed in a drowsy stupor from which, when I awoke, I found myself lying in a hospital bed, with a nun in a white hood watching over me. They are in sad, spiritual darkness, said a voice from the bed next to me, when the nun had finished her kind offices and retired. They are in the night of error, and yet there is the light of faith in those poor creatures. It was my comrade of the crimp wagon, his huge, broad face looming out from under a white nightcap and ensconced in the bed beside. What, you there, Herr Pastor? said I. Only a candidate, sir, answered the white nightcap, but praised be heaven, you've come too. You've had a wild time of it. You have been talking in the English language, with which I am acquainted, of Ireland, and a young lady, and Mick, and of another young lady, and of a house on fire, and of the British grenadiers, concerning whom you sung us parts of a ballad, and of a number of other matters appertaining, no doubt, to your personal history. It has been a very strange one, said I and perhaps there is no man in the world of my birth whose misfortunes can be at all compared to mine. I do not object to own that I am disposed to brag of my birth and other acquirements, for I have always found that if a man does not give himself a good word, his friends will not do it for him. Well, said my fellow patient, I have no doubt yours is a strange tale, and shall be glad to hear it anon, but at present you must not be permitted to speak much, for your fever has been long, and your exhaustion great. Where are we? I asked, and the candidate informed me that we were in the bishopric and town of Fulda, at present occupied by Prince Henry's troops. There had been a skirmish with an out-party of French near the town, in which a shot entering the wagon, the poor candidate had been wounded. As the reader knows already my history, I will not take the trouble to repeat it here, or give the additions with which I favoured my comrade in misfortune. But I confess that I told him ours was the greatest family and finest palace in Ireland, that we were enormously wealthy, related to all the peerage descended from the ancient kings, etc. And to my surprise, in the course of our conversation, I found that my interlocutor knew a great deal more about Ireland than I did. When, for instance, I spoke of my descent, from which race of kings, said he? Oh, said I, for my memory for dates was never very accurate, from the old ancient kings of all. What? Can you trace your origins to the sons of Japhet? said he. Faith I can answered I, and further, too. Nebuchadnezzar, if you like. I see, said the candidate, smiling, 
that you look upon those legends with incredulity. These Parthians and Nemedians, of whom your writers fondly make mention, cannot be authentically vouched for in history. Nor do I believe that we have any more foundation for the tales concerning them than for the legends relative to Joseph of Arimathea and King Bruce, which prevailed two centuries back in the sister island. And then he began a discourse about the Phoenicians, the Siths or Goths, the Tuadidanans, Tacitus, and King MacNeil, which was, to say the truth, the very first news I had heard of those personages. As for English, he spoke it as well as I, and had seven more languages, he said, equally at his command. For, on my quoting the only Latin line that I knew, that out of the poet Homer, which says, As in presenti perfectum fumat in avi, he began to speak to me in the Roman tongue, on which I was fain to tell him that we pronounced it in a different way in Ireland, and so got off the conversation. My honest friend's history was a curious one, and it may be told here to show of what motley materials our levies were composed. I am, said he, a Saxon by birth, my father being pastor of the village of Fankuchen, where I imbibed the first rudiments of knowledge. At sixteen, I am now twenty-three, having mastered the Greek and Latin tongues with the French, English, Arabic, and Hebrew, and having come into possession of a legacy of a hundred Reichs dollars, a sum amply sufficient to defray my university courses, I went to the famous Academy of Göttingen, where I devoted four years to the exact sciences and theology. Also, I learned what worldly accomplishments I could command, taking a dancing tutor at the expense of a Groschen lesson, a course of fencing from a French practitioner, and attending lectures on the great horse and the equestrian science at the hippodrome of a celebrated cavalry professor. My opinion is, that a man should know everything as far as in his power lies, that he should complete his cycle of experience, and, one science being as necessary as another, it behoves him. I am not of a saving turn, hence my little fortune of a hundred Reichs dollars, which has served to keep many a prudent man for a score of years, barely sufficed for five years' studies, after which my studies were interrupted my pupils fell off, and I was obliged to devote much time to shoe-binding in order to save money, and, at a future period, resume my academic course. During this period I contracted an attachment, here the candidate sighed a little, with a person who, though not beautiful and forty years of age, is yet likely to sympathize with my existence, and a month since my kind friend and patron, university prorector Dr. Nasenbroom, having informed me that the farer of Rumpelwitz was dead, asked whether I would like to have my name placed upon the candidate list, and if I were minded to preach a trial sermon. As the gaining of this living would further my union with my Amalia, I joyously consented, and prepared a discourse. If you like, I will recite it to you. No. Well, I will give you extracts from it upon our line of march. To proceed, then, with my biographical sketch, which is now very near a conclusion, or, as I should more correctly say, which has very nearly brought me to the present period of time, I preached that sermon at Rumpelwitz, in which I hoped that the Babylonian question was pretty satisfactorily set at rest. I preached it before the Herr Baron and his noble family, and some officers of distinction who were staying at his castle. Mr. Dr. Moser of Halle followed me in the evening discourse. But though his exercise was learned, and he disposed of a passage of Ignatius, which he proved to be a manifest interpolation, I do not think his sermon had the effect which mine produced, and that the Rumpelwitzers much relished it. After the sermon, all the candidates walked out of church together and supped lovingly at the blue stag in Rumpelwitz. While so occupied, a waiter came in and said that a person without wished to speak to one of the reverend candidates, the tall one. This could only mean me, for I was a head and shoulders higher than any other reverend gentleman present. 
I issued out to see who was the person desiring to hold converse with me, and found a man who I had no difficulty in recognizing as one of the Jewish persuasion. Sir, said this Hebrew, I have heard from a friend, who was in your church to-day, the heads of the admirable discourse you pronounced there. It has affected me deeply, most deeply. There are only one or two points on which I am yet in doubt, and if your honor could but condescend to enlighten me on these, I think, I think Solomon Hirsch would be a convert to your eloquence. What are these points, my good friend? said I, and I pointed out to him the twenty-four heads of my sermon, asking him in which of these his doubts lay. We had been walking up and down before the inn while our conversation took place, but the windows being open, and my comrades having heard the discourse in the morning, requested me rather peevishly not to resume it at that period. I therefore moved on with my disciple, and, at his request, began at once the sermon. For my memory is good for anything, and I can repeat any book I have read thrice. I poured out then, under the trees and in the calm moonlight, that discourse which I had pronounced under the blazing sun of noon. My Israelite only interrupted me by exclamations indicative of surprise, assent, admiration, and increasing conviction. Prodigious, said he. Wunderschön, would he remark at the conclusion of some eloquent passage. In a word, he exhausted the complimentary interjections of our language. And to compliments, what man is averse? I think we must have walked two miles when I got to my third head, and my companion begged I would enter his house, which we were now neared, and partake of a glass of beer, to which I was never averse. That house, sir, was the inn at which you too, if I judge aright, were taken. No sooner was I in the place than three crimps rushed upon me, told me I was a deserter and their prisoner, and called upon me to deliver up my money and papers, which I did with a solemn protest as to my sacred character. They consisted of my sermon in manuscript, Proctor Nasenbroom's recommendatory letter proving my identity, and three groschen four pfennigs in bullion. I had already been in the cart twenty hours when you reached the house. The French officer who lay opposite you, he who screamed when you trod on his foot for he was wounded, was brought in shortly before your arrival. He had been taken with his epaulets and regimentals, and declared his quality and rank, but he was alone. I believe it was some affair of love with a Hessian lady which caused him to be unattended. And as the persons into whose hands he fell will make more profit of him as a recruit than as a prisoner, he has made no share to our fate. He is not the first by many scores so captured. What of Monsieur de Soubise's cooks? and three actors out of a troop in the French camp, several deserters from your English troops. The men are led away by being told there is no flogging in the Prussian service. And three Dutchmen were taken besides. And you, said I, you who were just on the point of getting a valuable living, you who have so much learning, are you not indignant at the outrage? I am a Saxon said the candidate, and there is no use in indignation. Our government is crushed under Frederick's heel these five years, and I might as well hope for mercy from the Grand Mogul. Nor am I in truth discontented with my lot. I have lived on a penny bread for so many years that a soldier's rations will be a luxury to me. I do not care about more or less blows of a cane. All such evils are passing and therefore endurable. I will never, God willing, slay a man in combat, but I am not unanxious to experience on myself the effect of the war passion, which has so great an influence on the human race. It was for the same reason that I determined to marry Amalia, for a man is not a complete mensch until he is the father of a family, to be which is a condition of his existence, and therefore a duty of his education. Amalia must wait. She is out of the reach of want, being, indeed, cook to the Frau Prorector in Nasenbroom, my worthy patron's lady. I have one or two books with me which no one is likely to take from me, and one in my heart which is the best of all. 
if it shall please heaven to finish my existence here before i can prosecute my studies further what cause have i to repine i pray god i may not be mistaken but i think i have wronged no man and committed no mortal sin if i have i know where to look for forgiveness and if i die as i have said without knowing all that i would desire to learn shall i not be in a situation to learn everything and what can human soul ask for more pardon me for putting so many eyes in my discourse said the candidate but when a man is talking of himself tis the briefest and simplest way of talking in which perhaps though i hate egotism i think my friend was right although he acknowledged himself to be a mean-spirited fellow with no more ambition than to know the contents of a few musty books i think the man had some good in him especially in the resolution with which he bore his calamities many a gallant man of the highest honour is often not proof against these and has been known to despair over a bad dinner or to be cast down at a ragged elbowed coat my maxim is to bear all to put up with water if you cannot get burgundy and if you have no velvet to be content with frieze but burgundy and velvet are the best bien entendu and the man is a fool who will not seize the best when the scramble is open the heads of the sermon which my friend the theologian intended to impart to me were however never told for after our coming out of the hospital he was drafted into a regiment quartered as far as possible from his native country in pomerania while i was put into the bulow regiment of which the ordinary headquarters were in berlin the prussian regiments seldom change their garrisons as ours do for the fear of desertion is so great that it becomes necessary to know the face of every individual in the service and in time of peace men live and die in the same town this does not add as may be imagined to the amusements of the soldier's life it is lest any young gentleman like myself should take a fancy to a military career and fancy that of a private soldier a tolerable one that i am giving these i hope moral descriptions of what we poor fellows in the ranks really suffered as soon as we recovered we were dismissed from the nuns and the hospital to the town prison of fulda where we were kept like slaves and criminals with artillerymen with lighted matches at the doors of the courtyards and the huge black dormitory where some hundreds of us lay until we were dispatched to our different destinations it was soon seen by the exercise which were the old soldiers amongst us and which the recruits and for the former while we lay in prison there was a little more leisure though if possible a still more strict watch kept than over the broken-spirited yokels who had been coaxed or forced into the service to describe the characters here assembled would require mr gilray's own pencil there were men of all nations and callings the englishman boxed and bullied the frenchman played cards and danced and fenced the heavy germans smoked their pipes and drank beer if they could manage to purchase it those who had anything to risk gambled and at this sport i was pretty lucky for not having a penny when i entered the depot having been robbed of every farthing of my property by the rascally crimps i won near a dollar in my very first game at cards with one of the frenchmen who did not think of asking whether i could pay or not upon losing such at least is the advantage of having a gentlemanlike appearance it has saved me many a time since by procuring me credit when my fortunes were at their lowest ebb among the frenchmen there was a splendid man and soldier whose real name we never knew but whose ultimate history created no small sensation when it came to be known in the prussian army if beauty and courage are proofs of nobility as although i have seen some of the ugliest dogs and the greatest cowards in the world in the noblesse i have no doubt courage and beauty are this frenchman must have been of the highest families in france so grand and noble was his manner so superb his person he is not quite so tall as myself fair while i am dark and if possible rather broad in the shoulders he was the only man i ever met who could master me with the small sword 
with which he would pink me four times to my three. As for the sabre, I could knock him to pieces with it, and I could leap farther and carry more than he could. This, however, is mere egotism. The Frenchman with whom I became pretty intimate, for we were the two cocks, as it were, of the depot, and neither had any feeling of low jealousy, was called, for want of a better name, Le Blondin, on account of his complexion. He was a deserter, but had come in from the lower Rhine and the bishoprics, as I fancy, fortune having proved unfavorable to him at play, probably, and other means of existence being denied to him. I suspect the Bastille was waiting for him in his own country, had he taken a fancy to return thither. He was passionately fond of play and liquor, and thus we had a considerable sympathy together. When excited by one or the other he became frightful. I, for my part, can bear without wincing both ill luck and wine. Hence my advantage over him was considerable in our bouts, and I won enough money from him to make my position tenable. He had a wife outside, who, I take it, was the cause of his misfortunes and separation from his family, and she used to be admitted to see him twice or thrice a week, and never came empty-handed, a little brown bright-eyed creature whose ogles had made the greatest impression upon all the world. This man was drafted into a regiment that was quartered at Nysa, in Silesia, which is only a short distance from the Austrian frontier. He maintained always the same character for daring and skill, and was, in the secret republic of the regiment, which always exists as well as the regular military hierarchy, the acknowledged leader. He was an admirable soldier, as I have said, but haughty, dissolute, and a drunkard. A man of this mark, unless he takes care to coax and flatter his officers, which I always did, is sure to fall out with them. Le Blondin's captain was his sworn enemy, and his punishments were frequent and severe. His wife and the women of the regiment, this was after the peace, used to carry on a little commerce of smuggling across the Austrian frontier, where their dealings were winked at by both parties. And, in obedience to the instructions of her husband, this woman, from every one of her excursions, would bring in a little powder and ball, commodities which are not to be procured by the Prussian officer, and which were stowed away in secret till wanted. They were to be wanted, and that soon. Le Blancain had organized a great and extraordinary conspiracy. We don't know how far it went, how many hundreds or thousands it embraced, but strange were the stories told about the plot amongst us privates, for the news was spread from garrison to garrison and talked of by the army, in spite of all the government efforts to hush it up. <laughs> hush it up, indeed. I've been one of the people myself. I've seen the Irish Rebellion and know what is the Freemasonry of the poor. He made himself the head of the plot. There were no writings, nor papers. No single one of the conspirators communicated with any other than the Frenchman. But personally he gave his orders to them all. He had arranged matters for a general rising of the garrison at twelve o'clock on a certain day. The guard-houses in the town were to be seized, the sentinels cut down, and... Who knows the rest? Some of our people used to say that the conspiracy was spread through all Silesia, and that Le Blondin was to be made a general in the Austrian service. At twelve o'clock, and opposite the guardhouse by the Beaumer Tor of Nysa, some thirty men were lounging about in their undress, and the Frenchman stood near the sentinel of the guardhouse, sharpening a wood hatchet on a stone. At the stroke of twelve, he got up, split open the sentinel's head with a blow of his axe, and the thirty men, rushing the guardhouse, took possession of the arms there and marched at once to the gate. The sentry there tried to drop the bar, but the Frenchman rushed up to him, and with another blow of the axe, cut off his right hand, with which he held the chain. Seeing the men rushing out armed, the guard without the gate drew up across the road to prevent their passage, but the Frenchman's thirty gave them a volley, charged them with the bayonet, and brought down several, and the rest flying, the thirty rushed on. 
The frontier is only a league from Nysa, and they made rapidly towards it. But the alarm was given in the town, and what saved it was that the clock by which the Frenchman went was a quarter of an hour faster than any of the clocks in the town. The general was beat, the troops called to arms, and thus the men who were to have attacked the other guardhouses were obliged to fall into the ranks, and their project was defeated. This, however, likewise rendered the discovery of the conspirators impossible, for no man could betray his comrade, nor, of course, would he criminate himself. Cavalry was sent in pursuit of the Frenchman and his thirty fugitives, who were, by this time, far on their way to the Bohemian frontier. When the horse came up with them, they turned, received them with a volley and the bayonet, and drove them back. The Austrians were out at the barriers, looking eagerly on at the conflict. The women, who were on the lookout too, brought more ammunition to these intrepid deserters, and they engaged and drove back the dragoons several times. But in these gallant and fruitless combats much time was lost, and a battalion presently came up and surrounded the brave thirty, when the fate of the poor fellows was decided. They fought with the fury of despair, not one of them asked for quarter. When their ammunition failed they fought with the steel, and were shot down or bayoneted where they stood. The Frenchman was the very last man who was hit. He received a bullet in the thigh and fell and in this state was overpowered, killing the officer who first advanced to seize him. He, and the very few of his comrades who survived, were carried back to Nysa, and immediately as the ringleader he was brought before a council of war. He refused all interrogations which were made as to his real name and family. "'What matters who I am?' said he. "'You have me and will shoot me. My name will not save me were it ever so famous.' In the same way he declined to make a single discovery regarding the plot. It was all my doing, he said. Each man engaged in it only knew me, and is ignorant of every one of his comrades. The secret is mine alone, and the secret shall die with me. When the officers asked him what was the reason which induced him to mediate a crime so horrible, it was your infernal brutality and tyranny, he said. You are all butchers, ruffians, tigers and you owe it to the cowardice of your men that you were not murdered long ago." At this his captain burst into the most furious exclamations against the wounded man, and rushing up to him struck him a blow with his fist. But Le Blondin, wounded as he was, as quick as thought, seized the bayonet of one of the soldiers who supported him, and plunged it into the officer's breast. "'Scoundrel and monster,' said he, "'I shall have the consolation of sending you out of the world before I die.' He was shot that day. He offered to write to the king, if the officers would let his letter go sealed into the hands of the postmaster, but they feared, no doubt, that something might be said to inculpate themselves, and refused him the permission. At the next review Frederick treated them, it is said, with great severity, and rebuked them for not having granted the Frenchman his request. However, it was the king's interest to conceal the matter and so it was, as I have said before, hushed up, so well hushed up, that a hundred thousand soldiers in the army knew it, and many's the one of us that has drunk to the Frenchman's memory over our wine, as a martyr for the cause of the soldier. I shall have, doubtless, some readers who will cry out at this, that I am encouraging insubordination and advocating murder. Well, if these men had served as privates in the Prussian army, from 1760 to 1765, they would not be so apt to take objection. This man destroyed two sentinels to get his liberty. How many hundreds of thousands of his own and the Austrian people did King Frederick kill because he took a fancy to Silesia? It was the accursed tyranny of the system that sharpened the axe which brained the two sentinels of Nysa. And so let officers take warning, and think twice ere they visit poor fellows with the cane. I could tell many more stories about the army, but as, from having been a soldier myself, all my sympathies are in the ranks, no doubt my tales would be pronounced to be of an immoral tendency, and I had best therefore be brief. Fancy my surprise, while in this depot, 
when one day a well-known voice saluted my ear, and I heard a meager young gentleman, who was brought in by a couple of troopers, and received a few cuts across the shoulders from one of them, say in the best English, "'You infernal wascal! I'll be revenged for this! I'll write to my ambassador! As sure as my name's Fakenham of Fakenham!' I burst out laughing at this. It was my old acquaintance in my corporal's coat. Leeskin had sworn stoutly that he was really and truly the private, and the poor fellow had been drafted off and was to be made one of us. But I bear no malice, and having made the whole room roar with the story of the way in which I had tricked the poor lad, I gave him a piece of advice, which procured him his liberty. "'Go to the inspecting officer,' said I. "'If they once get you into Prussia, it is all over with you, and they will never give you up. Go now to the commandant of the depot. Promise him a hundred, five hundred guineas to set you free. Say that the crimping captain has your papers and portfolio. This was true. Above all, show him that you have the means of paying him the promised money, and I warrant you are set free. He did as I advised, and when we were put on the march, Mr. Fakenham found means to be allowed to go into hospital and while in hospital the matter was arranged as I had recommended. He had nearly, however, missed his freedom by his own stinginess in bargaining for it, and never showed the least gratitude towards me, his benefactor. I am not going to give any romantic narrative of the Seven Years' War. At the close of it, the Prussian army, so renowned for its disciplined valor, was officered and under-officered by native Prussians, it is true, but was composed, for the most part, of men hired or stolen, like myself, from almost every nation in Europe. The deserting to and fro was prodigious. In my regiment, Bulow's, alone before the war, there had been no less than six hundred Frenchmen, and as they marched out of Berlin for the campaign, one of the fellows had an old fiddle on which he was playing a French tune and his comrades danced almost rather than walked after him singing nous allons en france two years after when they returned to berlin there were only six of these men left the rest had fled or were killed in action the life the private soldier led was a frightful one to any but men of iron courage and endurance there was a corporal to every three men marching behind them and pitilessly using the cane so much so that it used to be said that in action there was a front rank of privates and a second rank of sergeants and corporals to drive them on. Many men would give way to the most frightful acts of despair under these incessant persecutions and tortures. And amongst several regiments of the army a horrible practice had sprung up, which for some time caused the greatest alarm to the government. This was a strange, frightful custom of child murder. The men used to say that life was unbearable, that suicide was a crime. In order to avert which, and to finish with the intolerable misery of their position, the best plan was to kill a young child which was innocent, and therefore secure of heaven, and then to deliver themselves up as guilty of the murder. The king himself, the hero, sage, and philosopher, the prince who always had liberality on his lips, and who affected a horror of capital punishments, was frightened at this dreadful protest on the part of the wretches whom he had kidnapped against his monstrous tyranny. But his only means of remedying the evil was strictly to forbid that such criminals should be attended by any ecclesiastic whatever, and denied all religious consolation. The punishment was incessant. Every officer had the liberty to inflict it, and in peace it was more cruel than in war. For when peace came, the king turned adrift such of his officers as were not noble, whatever their services might have been. He would call a captain to the front of his company and say, He is not noble, let him go. We were afraid of him somehow, and were cowed before him like the wild beasts before their keeper. I have seen the bravest men of the army cry like children at the cut of a cane. 
I have seen a little ensign of fifteen call out a man of fifty from the ranks, a man who had been in a hundred battles, and has stood presenting arms and sobbing and howling like a baby, while the young wretch lashed him over the arms and thighs with the stick. In a day of action this man would dare anything. A button might be awry then, and nobody touched him. But when they had made the brute fight, then they lashed him again into subordination. Almost all of us yielded to the spell. Scarce one could break it. The French officer I have spoken of as taken along with me was in my company and caned like a dog. I met him at Versailles twenty years afterwards, and he turned quite pale and sick when I spoke to him of old days. For God's sake, said he, don't talk of that time. I wake up from my sleep, trembling and crying, even now. As for me, after a very brief time, in which it must be confessed I tasted like my comrades of the cane, and after I had found opportunities to show myself to be a brave and dexterous soldier, I took the means I had adopted in the English army to prevent any further personal degradation. I wore a bullet around my neck which I did not take pains to conceal, and gave out that it should be for the man or officer who caused me to be chastised, and there was something in my character which made my superiors believe me, for that bullet had already served me to kill an Austrian colonel, and I would have given it to a Prussian with as little remorse. For what cared I for their quarrels, or whether the eagle under which I marched had one head or two? All I said was, no man shall find me tripping in my duty, but no man shall ever lay a hand upon me. And by this maxim I abided as long as I remained in the service. I do not intend to make a history of battles in the Prussian any more than in the English service. I did my duty in them as well as another, and by the time that my moustache had grown to a decent length, which it did when I was twenty years of age, there was not a braver, cleverer, handsomer, and, I must own, wickeder soldier in the Prussian army. I had formed myself to the condition of the proper fighting beast. On a day of action I was savage and happy. Out of the field I took all the pleasure I could get, and was by no means delicate as to its quality, or the manner of procuring it. The truth is, however, that there was among our men a much higher tone of society than among the clumsy louts in the English army, and our service was generally so strict that we had little time for doing mischief. I am very dark and swarthy in complexion, and was called by our fellows the Black Englander, the Schwarzer Englander, or the English Devil. If any service was to be done, I was sure to be put upon it. I got frequent gratifications of money, but no promotion, and it was on the day after I had killed the Austrian colonel, a great officer of Uhlans, whom I engaged, singly and on foot, that General Bulow, my colonel, gave me two Frederick d'Or in front of the regiment, and said, I reward thee now, but I fear I shall have to hang thee one day or other. I spent the money, and that I had taken from the colonel's body, every groschen that night with some jovial companions. But as long as war lasted, was never without a dollar in my purse. End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Barry leads a garrison life, and finds many friends there. After the war, our regiment was garrisoned in the capital, the least dull, perhaps, of all the towns in Prussia, but that does not say much for its gaiety. Our service, which was always severe, still left many hours of the day disengaged, in which we might take our pleasure, had we the means of paying for the same. Many of our mess got leave to work in trades, but I had been brought up to none, and besides my honour forbade me, for, as a gentleman, I could not soil my fingers by a manual occupation. 
but our pay was barely enough to keep us from starving and as i have always been fond of pleasure and as the position in which we now were in the midst of the capital prevented us from resorting to those means of levying contributions which are always pretty feasible in war time i was obliged to adopt the only means left me of providing for my expenses and in a word became the ordonnance or confidential military gentleman of my captain i spurned the office four years previously when it was made to me in the english service but the position is very different in a foreign country besides to tell the truth after five years in the ranks a man's pride will submit to many rebuffs which would be intolerable to him in an independent condition the captain was a young man and had distinguished himself during the war or he would never have been advanced to rank so early he was moreover the nephew and heir of the minister of police m de potsdorf a relationship which no doubt aided in the young gentleman's promotion captain de potsdorf was a severe officer enough on parade or in barracks but he was a person easily led by flattery i won his heart in the first place by my manner of tying my hair in queue indeed it was more neatly dressed than that of any man in the regiment and subsequently gained his confidence by a thousand little arts and compliments which as a gentleman myself i knew how to employ he was a man of pleasure which he pursued more openly than most men in the stern court of the king he was generous and careless with his purse and he had a great affection for rhine wine in all which qualities i sincerely sympathized with him and from which i of course had my profit he was disliked in the regiment because he was supposed to have too intimate relations with his uncle the police minister to whom it was hinted he carried the news of the corps before long i had ingratiated myself considerably with my officer and knew most of his affairs thus i was relieved from many drills and parades which would otherwise have fallen to my lot and came in for a number of perquisites which enabled me to support a genteel figure and to appear with some eclat in a certain though it must be confessed very humble society in berlin among the ladies i was always in a special favorite and was so polished with my behavior amongst them that they could not understand how i should have obtained my frightful nickname of the black devil in the regiment <laughs> he is not so black as he is painted i laughingly would say and most of the ladies agreed that the private was quite as well bred as the captain as indeed how should it be otherwise considering my education and birth when i was sufficiently ingratiated with him i asked leave to address a letter to my poor mother in ireland to whom i had not given any news of myself for many many years for the letters of foreign soldiers were never admitted to the post for fear of appeals or disturbances on the part of their parents abroad my captain agreed to find means to forward the letter and as i knew that he would open it i took care to give it him unsealed thus showing my confidence in him but the letter was as you may imagine written so that the writer should come to no harm were it intercepted i begged my honored mother's forgiveness for having fled from her i said that my extravagance and folly in my own country i knew rendered my return thither impossible but that she would at least be glad to know that i was well and happy in the service of the greatest monarch in the world and that the soldier's life was most agreeable to me and i added that i had found a kind protector and patron who i hoped would some day provide for me as i knew was out of her power to do i offered remembrances to all the girls at castle brady naming them from biddy to becky downwards and signed myself as in truth i was her affectionate son in captain potsdorf's company of the bulevish regiment of foot in garrison at berlin also i told her a pleasant story about the king kicking the chancellor and three judges downstairs as he had done one day when i was on guard at potsdam and said i hoped for another war soon when i might rise to be an officer 
In fact, you might have imagined my letter to be that of the happiest fellow in the world. And I was not on this head at all sorry to mislead my kind parent. I was sure my letter was read, for Captain Potsdorf began asking me some days afterwards about my family, and I told him the circumstances pretty truly, all things considered. I was a cadet of a good family, but my mother was almost ruined and had barely enough to support her eight daughters, whom I named. I had been to study for the law at Dublin, where I had got into debt and bad company, had killed a man in a duel, and would be hanged or imprisoned by his powerful friends if I returned. I had enlisted in the English service, where an opportunity for escape presented itself to me such as I could not resist, and hereupon I told the story of Mr. Fakenham of Fakenham in such a way as made my patron to be convulsed with laughter, and he told me afterwards that he had repeated the story at Madame de Camaquet's evening assembly, where all the world was anxious to have a sight of the young Englander. "'Was the British ambassador there?' I asked in a tone of the greatest alarm, and added, "'For heaven's sake, sir, do not tell my name to him, or he might ask to have me delivered up, and I have no fancy to go be hanged in my dear native country.' Potsdorf, laughing, said he would take care that I should remain where I was, on which I swore eternal gratitude to him. Some days afterwards, and with rather a grave face, he said to me, "'Redmond, I have been talking to our colonel about you, and as I wondered that a fellow of your courage and talents had not been advanced during the war, the general said they had had their eye upon you, that you were a gallant soldier and evidently come of a good stock, and no man in the regiment had had less fault found with him, but that no man merited promotion less.' You were idle, dissolute, and unprincipled. You had done a deal of harm to the men, and for all your talents and bravery he was sure you would come to no good. Sir, said I, quite astonished that any mortal man should have formed such an opinion of me, I hope General Bulow is mistaken regarding my character. I have fallen into bad company, it is true, but I have only done as other soldiers have done, and above all, I have never had a kind friend or protector before to whom I might show that I was worthy of better things. The general may say I am a ruined lad and send me to the devil, but be sure of this, I would go to the devil to serve you. This speech, I saw, pleased my patron very much, and as I was discreet and useful in a thousand delicate ways to him, he soon came to have a sincere attachment for me. One day or rather night, when he was tete-a-tete -tete with the lady of the Tabak's Rat von Doza, for instance, I... But there's no use in telling affairs which concern nobody now. Four months after my letter to my mother, I got, under cover to the captain, a reply, which created in my mind a yearning after home, and a melancholy which I cannot describe... I had not seen the dear soul's writing for five years. All the old days, and the fresh happy sunshine of the old green fields in Ireland, and her love, and my uncle, and Phil Purcell, and everything that I had done and thought, came back to me as I read the letter. And when I was alone I cried over it, as I hadn't done since the day when Nora jilted me. I took care not to show my feelings to the regiment or my captain. But that night, when I was to have taken tea at the garden house outside Brandenburg Gate with Fräulein Lotkin, the Tabak's Ratin's gentlewoman of company, I somehow had not the courage to go, but begged to be excused and went early to bed in barracks, out of which I went and came now almost as I willed, and passed a long night weeping and thinking about dear Ireland. Next day, my spirits rose again, and I got a ten-guinea bill cashed, which my mother sent in the letter, and gave a handsome treat to some of my acquaintance. The poor soul's letter was blotted all over with tears, full of texts, and written in the wildest, incoherent way. She said she was delighted to think I was under a Protestant prince, though she feared he was not in the right way. That right way, she said, she had the blessing to find, 
under the guidance of the reverend joshua jowles whom she sat under she said he was a precious chosen vessel a sweet ointment and a precious box of spikenard and made use of a great number more phrases that i could not understand but one thing was clear in the midst of all the jargon that the good soul loved her son still and thought and prayed day and night for her wild redmond has it not come across many a poor fellow in a solitary night's watch or in sorrow sickness or captivity that at that very minute most likely his mother is praying for him i often have these thoughts but they are none of the gayest and it's quite well that they don't come to you in company for where would be a set of jolly fellows then as mute as undertakers at a funeral i promise you i drank my mother's health that night in a bumper and lived like a gentleman whilst the money lasted she pinched herself to give it me as she told me afterwards and mr jowls was very wroth with her although the good soul's money was very quickly spent i was not long in getting more for i had a hundred ways of getting it and became a universal favourite with the captain and his friends now it was madame von doza who gave me a frederick door for bringing her a bouquet or a letter from the captain now it was on the contrary the old privy councillor who treated me with a bottle of rhenish and slipped into my hand a dollar or two in order that i might give him some information regarding the liaison between my captain and his lady but though i was not such a fool as not to take his money you may be sure i was not dishonourable enough to betray my benefactor and he got very little out of me when the captain and the lady fell out he began to pay his addresses to the rich daughter of the dutch minister i don't know how many letters and guineas the unfortunate tabax ratine handed over to me that i might get her lover back again but such returns are rare in love and the captain used only to laugh at her stale sighs and entreaties in the house of mynheer von huldensack i made myself so pleasant to high and low that i came to be quite intimate there and got the knowledge of a state secret or two which surprised and pleased my captain very much these little hints he carried to his uncle the minister of police who no doubt made his advantage of them and thus i began to be received quite in a confidential light by the potsdorf family and became a mere nominal soldier being allowed to appear in plain clothes which were i warrant you of a neat fashion and to enjoy myself in a hundred ways which the poor fellows my comrades envied as for the sergeants they were as civil to me as to an officer it was as much as their stripes were worth to offend a person who had the ear of the minister's nephew there was in my company a young fellow by the name of kurtz who was six feet high in spite of his name and whose life i had saved in some affair of the war what does this lad do after i had recounted to him one of my adventures but to call me a spy and informer and beg me not to call him do any more as is the fashion with young men when they are very intimate i had nothing for it but to call him out but i owed him no grudge i disarmed him in a twinkling and as i sent his sword flying over his head said to him kurtz did you ever know a man guilty of a mean action who can do as i do now this silenced the rest of the grumblers and no man ever sneered at me after that no man can suppose that to a person of my fashion the waiting in antechambers the conversation of footmen and hangers-on was pleasant but it was not more degrading than the barrack-room of which i need not say i was heartily sick my protestations of liking for the army were all intended to throw dust into the eyes of my employer i sighed to be out of slavery i knew i was born to make a figure in the world had i been one of the nicer garrison i would have cut my way to freedom by the side of the gallant frenchman but here i had only artifice to enable me to attain my end and was not i justified in employing it my plan was this i may make myself so necessary to monsieur de potsdorf that he will obtain my freedom once free with my fine person and good family i will do what ten thousand irish gentlemen have done before 
and will marry a lady of fortune and condition. And the proof that I was, if not disinterested, at least actuated by a noble ambition, is this. There was a fat grocer's widow in Berlin with six hundred dollars of rent and a good business, who gave me to understand that she would purchase my discharge if I would marry her. But I frankly told her that I was not made to be a grocer, and thus absolutely flung away a chance of freedom which she offered me. And I was grateful to my employers, more grateful than they to me. The captain was in debt, and had dealings with the Jews, to whom he gave notes of hand payable on his uncle's death. The old Herr von Potzdorf, seeing the confidence his nephew had in me, offered to bribe me to know what the young man's affairs really were. But what did I do? I informed Monsieur George von Potzdorf of the fact, and we made out in concert a list of little debts so moderate that they actually appeased the old uncle instead of irritating, and he paid them, being glad to get off so cheap. And a pretty return I got for this fidelity. One morning, the old gentleman being closeted with his nephew, he used to come to get any news stirring as to what the young officers of the regiment were doing, whether this or that gambled, who intrigued and with whom, and who was at the redotto on such a night, who was in debt and what not, for the king liked to know the business of every officer in his army, I was sent with a letter to the Marquis d'Argent, that afterwards married Mademoiselle Cauchois, the actress, and meeting the Marquis at a few paces off in the street, gave my message and returned to the captain's lodging. He and his worthy uncle were making my unworthy self the subject of conversation. He is noble, said the captain. Bah, replied the uncle, whom I could have throttled for his insolence. All the beggarly Irish who ever enlisted tell the same story. He was kidnapped by Galgenstein, resumed the other. A kidnapped deserter, said Monsieur Potsdorf. La belle affaire. Well, I promised the lad that I would ask for his discharge, and I am sure you can make him useful. You have asked his discharge, answered the elder, laughing. <laughs> bon Dieu, you are a model of probity. You'll never succeed to my place, George, if you are no wiser than you are just now. Make the fellow as useful to you as you please. He has a good manner and a frank countenance. He can lie with an assurance that I never saw surpassed, and fight, you say, on a pinch. The scoundrel does not want for good qualities. But he is vain, a spendthrift, and a bavard. As long as you have the regiment in terror over him, you can do as you like with him. Once let him loose, and the lad is likely to give you the slip. Keep on promising him. Promise to make him a general if you like. What the deuce do I care? There are spies enough to be had in this town without him. It was thus that the services I rendered to Monsieur Potsdorf were qualified by that ungrateful old gentleman. And I stole away from the room extremely troubled in spirit to think that another of my fond dreams was thus dispelled, and that my thoughts of getting out of the army by being useful to the captain, were entirely vain. For some time my despair was such that I thought of marrying the widow. But the marriages of privates are never allowed without the direct permission of the king, and it was a matter of very great doubt whether his majesty would allow a young fellow of twenty-two, the handsomest man in the army, to be coupled to a pimple-faced old woman of sixty, who was quite beyond the age when her marriage would be likely to multiply the subjects of his majesty. This hope of liberty was therefore vain. Nor could I hope to purchase my discharge unless any charitable soul would lend me a large sum of money, for though I made a good deal, as I have said, yet I have always through life an incorrigible knack of spending, and such is my generosity of disposition have been in debt ever since I was born. My captain, the sly rascal, gave me a very different version of his conversation with his uncle to that which I knew to be the true one, and said smilingly to me, Redmond, I have spoken to the minister regarding thy services, 
and thy fortune is made. Footnote. The service about which Mr. Barry here speaks has, and we suspect purposely, been described by him in very dubious terms. It is most probable that he was employed to wait at the table of strangers in Berlin, and to bring to the police minister any news concerning them which might at all interest the government. The great Frederick never received a guest without taking these hospitable precautions. And as for the duels which Mr. Barry fights, may we be allowed to hint a doubt as to a great number of these combats. It will be observed in one or two other parts of his memoirs that whenever he is at an awkward pass, or does what the world does not usually consider respectable, a duel in which he is victorious is sure to ensue from which he argues that he is a man of undoubted honour. End footnote. We shall get thee out of the army, appoint thee to a police bureau, and procure for thee an inspectorship of customs, and, in fine, allow thee to move in a better sphere than that in which fortune has hitherto placed thee. Although I did not believe a word of this speech, I affected to be very much moved by it, and, of course, swore eternal gratitude to the captain for his kindness to the poor Irish castaway. Your service at the Dutch ministers has pleased me very well. There is another occasion on which you may make yourself useful to us, and, if you succeed, depend on it your reward will be secure. What is the service, sir? said I. I will do anything for so kind a master. There is lately come to Berlin, said the captain, a gentleman in the service of the Empress Queen, who calls himself the Chevalier de Balibarri, and wears the red ribbon and star of the Pope's Order of the Spur. He speaks Italian or French indifferently, but we have some reason to fancy that this Monsieur de Balibarri is a native of your country of Ireland. Did you ever hear such a name as Balibarri in Ireland? Balibarri? Balibar a sudden thought flashed across me. No, sir, said I, I never heard the name. You must go into his service. Of course, you will not know a word of English. And if the Chevalier asks as to the particularity of your accent, say you are a Hungarian. The servant who came with him will be turned away today, and the person to whom he has applied for a faithful fellow will recommend you. You are a Hungarian you served in the Seven Years' War. You left the army on account of weakness of the loins. You served Monsieur de Kellenberg two years. He is now with the army in Silesia, but there is your certificate signed by him. You afterwards lived with Dr. Mopsius, who will give you a character if need be, and the landlord of the Star will, of course, certify that you are an honest fellow, but his certificate goes for nothing. As for the rest of your story, you can fashion that as you will, and make it as romantic or as ludicrous as your fancy dictates. Try, however, to win the Chevalier's confidence by provoking his compassion. He gambles a great deal, and wins. Do you know the cards well? Only a very little, as soldiers do. Oh, I had thought you more expert. You must find out if the Chevalier cheats. If he does, we have him. He sees the English and Austrian envoys continually, and the young men of either ministry sup repeatedly at his house. Find out what they talk of, for how much each plays, especially if any of them play on parole. If you can read his private letters, of course you will, though about those which go to the post you need not trouble yourself. We look at them there. But never see him write a note without finding out to whom it goes, and by what channel or messenger. He sleeps with the keys of his dispatch-box on a string round his neck. Twenty Fredericks if you get an impression of the keys. You will, of course, go in plain clothes. You had best brush the powder out of your hair and tie it with a ribbon simply. Your moustache, of course, you must shave off. With these instructions, and a very small gratuity, the captain left me. When I saw him again, he was amused at the change in my appearance. I had, not without a pang, for they were as black as jet and curved elegantly, 
shaved off my moustaches, had removed the odious grease and flour which I always abominated out of my hair, and had mounted a demure French coat, black satin breeches, and a maroon plush waistcoat, and a hat without a cockade. I looked as meek and humble as any servant out of place could possibly appear, and I think not my own regiment, which was now at the review at Potsdam, would have known me. Thus accoutred I went to the Star Hotel, where this stranger was, my heart beating with anxiety, and something telling me that this Chevalier de Ballybarry was no other than Barry of Ballybarry, my father's eldest brother, who had given up his estate in consequence of his obstinate adherence to the Romish superstition. Before I went to present myself, I went to look, in the remise, at his carriage. Had he the Barry arms? Yes, there they were. Argent, a bend jewels, with four escallops of the field. The ancient coat of my house! They were painted in a shield about as big as my hat, on a smart chariot handsomely gilded, surmounted with a coronet, and supported by eight or nine cupids cornucopias, and flower-baskets, according to the queer, heraldic fashion of those days. It must be he. I felt quite faint as I went up the stairs. I was going to present myself before my uncle in the character of a servant. You are the young man whom Monsieur de Sebach recommended? I bowed and handed him a letter from that gentleman, with which my captain had taken care to provide me. As he looked at it, I had leisure to examine him. My uncle was a man of sixty years of age, dressed superbly in a coat and breeches of apricot-colored velvet, a white satin waistcoat embroidered with gold like the coat. Across his breast went the purple ribbon of his order of the spur, and the star of the order, an enormous one, sparkled on his breast. He had rings on all his fingers, a couple watches in his fobs a rich diamond solitaire in the black ribbon around his neck and fastened to the bag of his wig. His ruffles and frills were decorated with a profusion of the richest lace. He had pink silk stockings rolled over one knee and tied with gold garters, and enormous diamond buckles to his red-heeled shoes. A sword mounted in gold in a white fish-skin scabbard, and a hat richly laced and lined with white feathers which were lying on a table beside him, complimented the costume of this splendid gentleman. In height he was about my size, that is, six feet and half an inch. His cast of features singularly like mine, and extremely distingué. One of his eyes was closed with a black patch, however. He wore a little white and red paint, by no means an unusual ornament in those days, and a pair of moustaches, which fell over his lip and hid a mouth that I afterwards found had rather a disagreeable expression. When his beard was removed, his upper teeth appeared to project very much, and his countenance wore a ghastly fixed smile, by no means pleasant. It was very imprudent of me, but when I saw the splendor of his appearance, the nobleness of his manner, I felt it impossible to keep disguise with him, and when he said, "'Ah, you are a Hungarian, I see,' I could hold no longer. "'Sir,' said I, "'I am an Irishman, and my name is Redmond Barry, of Ballyberry.' As I spoke, I burst into tears. I can't tell why. But I had seen none of my kith or kin for six years, and my heart longed for someone.' End of chapter 7and there is many a man that will not understand the cause of the burst of feeling which I have confessed took place on my seeing my uncle. 
he never for a minute thought to question the truth of what I said. "'Mother of God!' cried he. "'It's my brother Harry's son!' and I think in my heart he was as much affected as I was at thus suddenly finding one of his kindred. For he too was an exile from home, and a friendly voice, a look, brought the old country back to his memory again, and the old days of his boyhood. "'I'd give five years of my life to see them again,' said he, after caressing me very warmly. "'What?' asked I. Why, replied he, the green fields and the river and the old round tower and the burying place at Ballyberry. Twas a shame for your father to part with the land, Redmond, that went so long with the name. He then began to ask me concerning myself, and I gave him my history at some length, at which the worthy gentleman laughed many times, saying that I was a berry all over. In the middle of my story he would stop me to make me stand back to back and measure with him, by which I ascertained that our heights were the same, and that my uncle had a stiff knee, moreover, which made him walk in a peculiar way, and uttered, during the course of the narrative, a hundred exclamations of pity and kindness and sympathy. It was, Holy Saints! and Mother of Heaven! and Blessed Mary! continually by which, and with justice, I concluded that he was still devotedly attached to the ancient faith of our family. It was with some difficulty that I came to explain to him the last part of my history, viz. that I was put into his service as a watch upon his actions, of which I was to give information, in a certain quarter. When I told him, with a great deal of hesitation, of this fact, he burst out laughing and enjoyed the joke amazingly. "'The rascals,' said he, "'they think to catch me, do they? "'Why, Redmond, my chief conspiracy is a faro bank "'But the king is so jealous "'that he will see a spy in every person "'who comes to his miserable capital "'in the great sandy desert here. "'Ah, my boy, I must show you Paris and Vienna.' I said there was nothing I longed for more than to see any city but Berlin, and should be delighted to be free of the odious military service. Indeed, I thought, from his splendor of appearance, the knick-knacks about the room, the gilded carriage in the Rémis, that my uncle was a man of vast property, and that he would purchase a dozen, nay, a whole regiment of substitutes, in order to restore me to freedom." but I was mistaken in my calculations regarding him, as his history of himself speedily showed me. "'I have been beaten about the world,' said he, "'ever since the year 1742, when my brother and your father, and heaven forgive him, cut my family estate from under my heels by turning heretic in order to marry that scold of a mother of yours. Well, let bygones be bygones.' "'Tis probable that I should have run through the little property, as he did in my place, "'and I should have had to begin a year or two later the life I have been leading "'ever since I was compelled to leave Ireland. "'My lad, I have been in every service, and between ourselves, oh, money in every capital in Europe. "'I made a campaign or two with the panders under Austrian Trank. "'I was captain in the guard of His Holiness the Pope.' I made the campaign of Scotland with the Prince of Wales, a bad fellow, my dear, caring more for his mistress and his brandy-bottle than for the crowns of the three kingdoms. I have served in Spain and in Piedmont, but I have been a rolling stone, my good fellow. Play, play has been my ruin. That and beauty, here he gave a leer which made him, I must confess, look anything but handsome. Besides, his rouged cheeks were all beslobbered with the tears which he had shed on receiving me. Oh, the women have made a fool of me, my dear Redmond. I am a soft-hearted creature, and this minute at sixty-two have no more command of myself than when Peggy Dwyer made a fool of me at sixteen. Faith, sir, says I, laughing, I think it runs in the family. And described to him, much to his amusement, my romantic passion for my cousin, 
Nora Brady. He resumed his narrative. The cards now are my only livelihood. Sometimes I am in luck, and then I lay out my money in these trinkets, you see. It's property, look you, Redmond, and the only way I have found of keeping a little about me. When the luck goes against me, why, my dear, my diamonds go to the pawnbrokers and I wear paste. Friend Moses the goldsmith will pay me a visit this very day, for the chances have been against me all the week past, and I must raise money for the bank tonight. Do you understand the cards? I replied that I could play as soldiers do, but had no great skill. We'll practice in the morning, my boy, said he, and I'll put you up to a thing or two worth knowing. Of course I was glad to have such an opportunity of acquiring knowledge, and professed myself delighted to receive my uncle's instruction. The Chevalier's account of himself rather disagreeably affected me. All his show was on his back, as he said. His carriage, with the fine gilding, was a part of his stock in trade. He had a sort of mission from the Austrian court. It was to discover whether a certain quantity of alloyed ducats which had been traced to Berlin were from the king's treasury. But the real end of Monsieur de Balibarie was play. There was a young attaché of the English embassy, my lord Dossis, afterwards Viscount and Earl of Crabs in the English peerage, who was playing high, and it was after hearing of the passion of this young English nobleman that my uncle, then at Prague, determined to visit Berlin and engage him. For there is a sort of chivalry among the knights of the dice-box. The fame of great players is known all over Europe. I have known the Chevalier de Casanova, for instance, to travel six hundred miles from Paris to Turin for the purpose of meeting Mr. Charles Fox, then only my Lord Holland's dashing son, afterwards the greatest of European orators and statesmen. It was agreed that I should keep my character a valet, that in the presence of strangers I should not know a word of English, that I should keep a good lookout on the trumps when I was serving the champagne and punch about, and, having a remarkably fine eyesight and a great natural aptitude, I was speedily able to give my dear uncle much assistance against his opponents at the green table. Some prudish persons may affect indignation at the frankness of these confessions, but heaven pity them. Do you suppose that any man who has lost or won a hundred thousand pounds at play will not take the advantages which his neighbor enjoys? They're all the same. But it is only the clumsy fool who cheats, who resorts to the vulgar expedients of cogged dice and cut cards. Such a man is sure to go wrong some time or other, and is not fit to play in the society of gallant gentlemen. And my advice to people who see such a vulgar person at his pranks is, of course, to back him while he plays, but never, never to have anything to do with him. Play grandly, honorably. Be not, of course, cast down at losing, but above all, be not eager at winning, as mean souls are. And indeed, with all one's skill and advantages, winning is often problematical. I have seen a sheer ignoramus that knows no more of play than of Hebrew blunder you out of five thousand pounds in a few turns of the cards. I have seen a gentleman and his confederate play against another and his confederate. One never is secure in these cases, and when one considers the time and labor spent, the genius, the anxiety, the outlay of money required, the multiplicity of bad debts that one meets with, for dishonorable rascals are to be found at the play-table, as everywhere else in the world. I say, for my part, the profession is a bad one, and indeed have scarcely ever met a man who, in the end, profited by it. I am writing now with the experience of a man of the world. At the time I speak of, I was a lad, dazzled by the idea of wealth, and respecting, certainly too much, my uncle's superior age and station in life. There is no need to particularize here the little arrangements made between us. The playmen of the present day want no instruction, I take it, and the public have little interest in the matter. 
but simplicity was our secret. Everything successful is simple. If, for instance, I wiped the dust off a chair with my napkin, it was to show that the enemy was strong in diamonds. If I pushed it, he had ace-king. If I said, punch or wine, my lord, hearts was meant. If wine or punch, clubs. If I blew my nose, it was to indicate that there was another confederate employed by the adversary. And then, I warrant you, some pretty trials of skill would take place. My lord Dossis, although so young, had a very great skill and cleverness with the cards in every way, and it was only from hearing Frank Punter, who came with him, yawn three times when the Chevalier had the ace of trumps, that I knew we were Greek to Greek, as it were. My assumed dullness was perfect, and I used to make Monsieur de Potsdorf laugh with it, when I carried my little reports to him at the garden-house outside the town where he gave me rendezvous. These reports, of course, were arranged between me and my uncle beforehand. I was instructed, and it is always far the best way, to tell as much truth as my story would possibly bear. When, for instance, he would ask me, what does the chevalier do of a morning? Oh, he goes to church regularly. He was very religious. And after hearing mass comes home to breakfast. Then he takes an airing in his chariot till dinner, which is served at noon. After dinner he writes his letters, if he have any letters to write. But he has very little to do in this way. His letters are to the Austrian envoy, with whom he corresponds but who does not acknowledge him. And being written in English, of course, I look over his shoulder. He generally writes for money. He says he wants it to bribe the secretaries of the treasury in order to find out really where the alloyed ducats come from. But, in fact, he wants it to play of evenings when he makes his party with Kalsabigi, the lottery contractor, the Russian attaches, two from the English embassy, my lords Dossis and Punter, who play a jeu d'enfer, and a few more. The same set meet every night at supper. There are seldom any ladies. Those who come are chiefly French ladies, members of the corps de ballet. He wins often, but not always. Lord Dossis is a very fine player. The Chevalier Elliot, the English minister, sometimes comes, on which occasion the secretaries do not play. Monsieur de Balibarry dines at the missions, but en petit comité, not on grand days of reception. Kasabigi, I think, is his confederate at play. He has won lately, but the week before last he pledged his solitaire for four hundred ducats. Do he and the English attaches talk together in their own language? Yes, he and the envoy spoke yesterday for half an hour about the new danseuse and the American troubles, chiefly about the new danseuse. It will be seen that the information I gave was very minute and accurate, though not very important. But such as it was, it was carried to the ears of that famous hero and warrior, the philosopher of Saint Souci, and there was not a stranger who entered the capital but his actions were similarly spied and related to Frederick the Great. As long as the play was confined to the young men of the different embassies, His Majesty did not care to prevent it. Nay, he encouraged play at all the missions, knowing full well that a man in difficulties can be made to speak, and that a timely rouleau of Frederick's would often get him a secret worth many thousands. He got some papers from the French house in this way and I have no doubt that my lord Dossis would have supplied him with information at a similar rate, had his chief not known the young nobleman's character pretty well, and had, as is usually the case, the work of the mission performed by a steady routurier, while the young brilliant bloods of the suite sported their embroidery at the balls, or shook their Mechlin ruffles over the green tables at Faro. I have seen many scores of these young sprigs since, of these and their principles, and, mon Dieu, what fools they are! What dullards, what fribbles, what addle-headed simple coxcombs! This is one of the lies of the world 
this diplomacy or how could we suppose that were the profession as difficult as the solemn red box and tape men would have us believe they would invariably choose for it little pink-faced boys from school with no other claim than mamma's title and able at most to judge of a curricle a new dance or a neat boot when it became known however to the officers of the garrison that there was a faro table in town they were wild to be admitted to the sport and in spite of my entreaties to the contrary my uncle was not averse to allow the young gentlemen their fling and once or twice cleared a handsome sum out of their purses it was in vain that i told him that i must carry the news to my captain before whom his comrades would not fail to talk and who would thus know of the intrigue even without my information tell him said my uncle they'll send you away said i and then what is to become of me make your mind easy said the latter with a smile you shall not be left behind i warrant you go take a last look at your barracks make your mind easy say a farewell to your friends in berlin the dear souls how they will weep when they hear you're out of the country and as sure as my name is barry out of it you shall go but how sir said i recollect mr fakenham of fakenham said he knowingly tis you yourself taught me how go get me one of my wigs open my dispatch box yonder where the great secrets of the austrian chancery lie put your hair back off your forehead clap me on this patch and these moustaches and now look in the glass the chevalier de balibari said i bursting with laughter and began walking the room in his manner with his stiff knee the next day when i went to make my report to m de potsdorf i told him of the young prussian officers that had been of late gambling and he replied as i expected that the king had determined to send the chevalier out of the country he is a stingy curmudgeon i replied i have had but three fredericks from him in two months and i hope you will remember your promise to advance me why three fredericks were too much for the news you've picked up said the captain sneering it is not my fault that there has been no more i replied when is he to go sir the day after tomorrow you say he drives after breakfast and before dinner when he comes out to his carriage a couple of gendarmes will mount the box and the coachman will get his orders to move on and his baggage sir said i oh that will be sent after him i have a fancy to look into that red box which contains his papers you say and at noon after parade shall be at the inn you will not say a word to any one there regarding the affair and will wait for me at the chevalier's rooms until my arrival we must force that box you are a clumsy hound or you would have got the key long ago i begged the captain to remember me and so took my leave of him the next night i placed a couple of pistols under the carriage seat and i think the adventures of the following day are quite worthy of the honours of a separate chapter End of chapter 8